Welcome to day two of our training class. And uh, um, this is Patrick again, although I'm, I, I want to, um, I, I watched the video from yesterday. I was uh, out for most of the, the session yesterday and was really impressed with uh, the demos that, uh, that Joanne, Kirby, and Yisha did. Um, I hope you were too. I wanted to, to ask for some quick feedback and just see what your, um, your highlight of yesterday was. Did you dream about any special design patterns? Um, and then we'll do a quick review. Um, Emma, do you want to go first? Any major highlights for you yesterday? Yeah, um, I know that Nicole briefly mentioned during that meeting, we've actually implemented, at least in the forms that we have in test, I believe all of the um, different functionality that was demoed yesterday. But I actually had never had the benefit of seeing in particular the DBXL demoed from beginning to end. So that was really beneficial for me because I've only ever worked on forms where it's been pre-configured. So that helped a lot. Yeah. With and it was really, work. it was really dense going through that. And there was a lot of, I'm, I'm sure you probably have questions about like, uh, you know, the, the user keys and things like that, that, that Joanne went through. Um, but, but it all made sense. It all yeah. Good. Yeah. Right. It, it, I had the benefit of having seen how it looked in our setup in existing forms. We actually have a form that we, as a financial institution, um, our forms, we really wanted to use DBXL to draw in um, active um, member or customer data that we could use in filling out forms. And we actually have, I believe, at least two, if not three forms that are actively querying the database and drawing oh, right. in. And you're using, so you're using query DB, is that right? The, the yes. web service? Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. So we're so I had the benefit of seeing it in action before I then saw it demoed. So it really, there were a lot of aha moments for me of saying, "Oh, that's why it's set up that way," rather oh, that's than great. kind of that's great. yeah. So you, had a, you had a slate to begin with, and yeah, um, and, it, and it was it was awesome to see the beginning though because if you, you yeah sorry yep <laughs> <Go on>. <laughs> <laughs> well if you had asked me to build it without that demo I wouldn't have been able to because I, I was going to ask if you have the, yeah if you have the XTP. <laughs> that Joanne has, uh, that she demoed in the, um, yes. th that, that's yeah. awesome. Okay, great. Well, thanks for that feedback. Uh, let's see, uh, Benjamin, I know you're going to, you're going to meet today, but um, we got lots to cover today, but did you have any highlights for yesterday? Um, yeah, the, a lot of the, um, I think one of the things is uh, the fact that it works in um, a list versus a library only. Um, but again, we have like a very old version of the application. So, um, um, there are just a lot of features and functions. Um, it's much more advanced than what we currently have. So. Cool. Yeah, I was surprised. I, I learned something new yesterday too, and watching the video recap, the, the circular uh, images was I think a really cool CSS technique that um, we, we saw with that uh, end of day report form. Richard, did you have any, um, any inspirations from yesterday that you want to share? Well, uh, I actually ran into a couple of problems <laughs> uh, with the lab. So um, I, I wasn't able to get the validation to work. Um, and uh, <laughs> so- We should look um, at that. We should, yeah. we should, we should debug that. Um, do you want to just, to show us real quick what happened? Um, i tell you what, you want to move on to someone else and then I can <laughs> okay. let you know when I get it pulled up or? Uh... Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're just doing a quick review recap of uh, yesterday and uh, and then sh t talking about the topics for today. And um, so I'll just go over some of this here for the review. I mean, obviously uh, Forms Your is meant to be a replacement for InfoPath, but also it takes it to another level in, uh, in many ways, the CSS is one way. Another way is these new features we've had to, uh, for example, query these JSON-based web services. And, and that means we can tie into these new um, web services out there like, like the authentication from Twilio, um, you know, the Authy API. API. We can also uh, tie into uh, Salesforce, you know, DocuSign. There are all kinds of new, uh, everyone's got a web service these days. And if you're wanting to query data from them, you typically have to use JSON. And, and that's uh, one of the major 
early day improvements that we made with Form Zero because InfoPath could not query JSON. So we did that, I think it was like five years ago. Um, but there's other stuff too. Um, a lot of the, the techniques that we are going to be demoing uh, today and tomorrow, are, there's some, very, some new stuff too. Um, why is it important to make your data connections dynamic? Emma, do you want to take that? Sorry, I'm muted. Um, <laughs> well, I know that one of the reasons that we make the data connections dynamic is so that we can have the form connect to different libraries without actually having to go in and change anything within the form. We set it up to connect to, I, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think it almost works almost like an alias from what I understand about it. Right. And you're essentially saying, take this data connection, it may change. The form, however, doesn't know that it's changing. It just knows that it's connecting to data that it's expecting to come in and populate. As long as the data is the same schema, the same format, the same structure, then it, you know, we, we just point it to a different site and, and, and use those a change, uh, change, was it the change uh, URL command? I, for, I forget the name of it, but there's a several commands that we use. It's the change connection URL, right? right? Joanne? <laughs> yes, that's correct. <laughs> it's earlier. I haven't, I need to use some more coffee or something. Um, but, but yeah, so um, we, we, you know, typically the most important reason for, for making it dynamic is so that you can move your forms, like you said, from, from test to production with zero change. And that means that whatever you've tested in test is what you're going to have on, on the production. You don't have to do another test pass on production after you deploy it because it is the same template. And that, um, because it, you know, it's exactly the same, that reduces uh, possible maintenance issues that you would have by updating those data connections you know, when you go to production. That's a typical scenario. Um, let's see, how does Form Zero help you retrieve user information? Yesha, good, good evening. Do you want to answer that question? Yeah, so um, we can use the uh, Kadabra rules command called get user profile by name. So that's a command that uh, offers us a way to retrieve SharePoint user profile data and be able to display them in a form. Great. There's there's two ways to use that command. Um, there's two two kinds of, of SharePoint user information data with SharePoint Online. There's the the user profile service, but then there's also the the site users, and you can just change it to point to one or the other with just a, a parameter. I don't know if you covered that yesterday, um, but. There, there is a switch there uh, to to change it, and we've done webinars talking about the difference between the two. Uh, so, if you have questions on that, one of them is updated from Active Directory, and the other one is updated uh, differently. And some some properties, there's more properties in one area than the other. And anyway, that's all in a webinar. We should probably dig that up as a reference. And did you talk about it yesterday at all, Joanne, Yesha, Kirby? No, we didn't have a chance to yeah. talk about Lots it. Lots of stuff to It's the source parameter. I just want to mention that. <laughs> do, you, do you remember what the, the big difference is between those different sources? Um, when you use profiles uh, for your source parameter, it will query the, uh, the user profiles in SharePoint. But if you use the site users, it will query the site users list in the site where you're in. <laughs> Great. So it's site specific. And mm -hmm. Chris, user profile services, everyone on it. Right. But that's everyone on the site too. That's kind of, we need to probably clarify that a little more, but uh, what is the get errors command and why should we use it? Richard, since uh, you had asked the validation question or you had validation issue, let me ask you that, that question there as our recap review here. Do you uh, know what the answer is to four? Uh, well, I, I really like how it displays the, um, um, all of the fields that uh, are requiring validation a lot better than InfoPath would. Um, um, it's a lot more user friendly just to see the, you know, what uh, fields need to get filled out. Um, yeah. um, I guess it can do, does it do other things other than the validation or um, is that pretty much um, yeah, I mean, the get errors command gives you more information than you'd get with InfoPath. So you can get uh, data back about what the actual error was. So you can display that. I think that's what you're saying. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, with InfoPath, you get that pop-up dialogue, right? Um, right. With an error message. And, and this way you can display, if you have more than one error, you can display them all and you don't have to have somebody, 
you know, you just see the top one or whatever it is. is that, that's right. I think. Um, I do. I do have the, the form pulled up. If, if you wanted to look at that or we can look at it later. Um, yeah, this is a good time to recap and, and review any lab issues. Um, and this is a small class size. So I think that it, the others would benefit also from a quick debug. Um, so maybe if we just took a few minutes to take a look at it, that'd be great. You want to share out? Sure. Sure. Let's see, this share screen. Let's see if this works. Um, Joanne, I forget who, who did the, the validation lab yesterday? Oh yeah, that was me, Patrick. Okay, <laughs> cool. Um, it's saying I can't share uh, while someone else is sharing, I guess. Oh yeah, sorry, I'll stop sharing. <laughs> okay. It's a new Zoom feature. Okay. It used to be you could yeah. just share over everyone else, but. Let's, let's see if this will work here. Um, did and, then we're, and, and Benjamin, were you able to actually look at other um, the labs at all? Did you have time yesterday to look at this lab? Um, no. I followed along. Cool. cool. I'm going to open this form and just so we can quickly see what's, I, I have these first two fields that were set to, to, to validate, uh, but for some reason it's submitting the form. Um, and uh, if I pull that form up, um, yeah, this is the, yeah, this is the correct form. So I'm not sure where to start to troubleshoot it. Um, I mean, obviously we've got these two fields. I've got validation here. I click on the submit button again. So, and and the, uh, you've got the run validation running there. So let's get errors. Now is that returning, um, I guess the question is, is it returning, is get errors working? You might have a double quote there actually. You click on the, uh, the first, action and let's okay. just open that up and let's remove that that first quote remove the quotes from, from did, the beginning so I, yeah i did see that and then when i open it up i don't see a second quote in there isn't that uh, weird yeah just just go ahead and delete that and and delete the one at the end too oh okay I guess. Easy as that. <laughs> I, that was probably okay yeah i <laughs> I was keeping the quote in the uh, the lap there. You want to try it real quick to see if that does yeah, the trick? I bet you. Okay, so let me yeah, save that. <laughs> okay. Sometimes you know, we all look at things a little differently. Laughable. No worries. <laughs> um, okay. Try to get past that, that screen share thing there. Now we're going to do a, a quick, uh, I think, demo of our forms designer. Some of you may have already seen the webinar we did a couple weeks ago on our, our Forms Designer Alpha. We've been making a lot of progress on the browser-based Forms Designer to replace InfoPath Designer. We're hoping to ship that at the end of the year, and we'll be doing a cameo of that probably um, either today or tomorrow, uh, tomorrow or, or Friday. Fourteen, eleven, thirteen. Yeah, this is it. Okay. Update. Yay, there we go. Success. I always love success. when it's that fast. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. great. Cool. Very cool. All right. Awesome. Um, yeah, Joanne, so, so back to your slides there. All right. We had one more question left uh, with uh, the quiz, the recap. Yep. And what is that question? That is, what is the benefit of submitting your forms to DBXL? Emma, that's going to you. Actually, Benjamin, you have DBXL. We'll, we'll ask you that question. If you're still there. Um, I'm still here. What is the benefit of, um, well, for us, it's uh, the data, um, saving the data in SQL. So 
Yeah, pretty simple answer. <laughs> yeah, and there's other things too that we've added over the years, uh, the ability to email, generate PDFs, obviously querying the database is something that um, Emma and Nicole will be using or are using already. Um, and then there's, there's a host of other web methods. We actually have over a hundred web methods in that web service. There's actually like seven or eight web services and, and lots of web methods. And we use that over the years. Whenever we have a project that needs something, we've always just added something, a tool, you know, a web method there. In fact, we haven't made a lot of changes recently to DBXL. We did ship 3.4, I believe, earlier this year. Um, and we did make a change recently to uh, allow for um, this anonymous mode for a couple of the web methods. So I think that for get history and get, get version history and get document history, those now have um, versions that are tokenized, kind of like the query DB with um, user key is tokenized with that user key. So those two me web methods are new as of like last month. So we actually continue to make changes there. Okay, so let's see, what's next, Joanne? Shall we do a quick overview of what we're gonna to do today? I guess you've got the form. Oh yeah, oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, day two. So um, this is some new stuff that we haven't showed people this year. I mean, I don't know if we had floating labels in the April training. We certainly did not have the task panes, right? I'm trying to remember, did we? Well, uh, we have the task pane in the April training, but it's a fixed task pane. So we're now showing a, a task pane that is more uh, collapsible That's using great. a toggle button, yeah. Okay, well, I um, I think I'll just let you guys r run with it then and uh, I'll be lurking here. But any questions, um, any other questions on day one from anybody out there? I do have a meeting at uh, the top of the hour, but I'll be staying on here until that. So, uh, Joanna, you want to, or Yesha, are you, who's going to go first? Um, yeah, I'll just uh, talk about the, uh, some of the, <laughs> what they're going to see in the labs today. So, uh, lab one, Yesha will show you how you can make your forms responsive so that the form looks good regardless of the size of the window. And as you know, there's a high demand now in making uh, websites responsive, you know, so we, we thought about designing responsive forms. So this is a, a good opportunity to, to learn and make your uh, forms look good, especially in mobile view. And lab two, Yesha will again talk about how to make the, the labels float and I just saw an example of this in uh, in Gmail, actually. Um, just to to show you what you're gonna see is something like this. Um, yeah, so. So you can see Gmail is using that floating label. So when I tap on the on the field here, the the label will float in that field. So we thought about applying this technique also, and uh, Karu Okamura discovered this technique. Um, so we're teaching you how to to apply that in your forms as well. So Yesha is going to to show you that, and then uh, I'm going to show you lab three, uh, the flexible task plane. I showed a preview on this yesterday. And then uh, Curvy will talk about uh, the debug slider. Uh, you've already seen this in the starter form. We have a, uh, a slider at the bottom where we um, use for debugging QRL's commands. And then last, Curvy will also talk about the overlays. And as you can see, the training form, uh, the course directory form is also already using the, the overlay. So it's a good addition to your form design as well. So um, Yasha, if you're ready, um, I'll pass the mic to you and I'll yep. stop sharing now. Okay. 
All right. So let me just share my screen and let me know if you can see it now. Yeah, I can see your screen. All right. So for our first lab, we are going to show you how to implement CSS uh, file to design your forms using our Qros command called load restore. So implementing CSS helps you design your forms based on a specific theme, uh, be it your organization color or and styling or your or even your own design style. So and it's not just about styling. Another benefit of using CSS in your forms is to make it mobile responsive, which means the layout and uh, content responds or adapts based on the size of the screen they are presented on. And as you know, our devices have different screen sizes, our laptop, tablets, and phones. So CSS helps you make your forms responsive to all sorts of devices. So um, let me uh, show you first the form that has no CSS in it. And let me open that up. So let's open our responsive form. Starter with no CSS. So this is our basic form created in InfoPath and no CSS has been applied yet. And if you try to minimize your screen, it's not being responsive as you can see, and this won't be mobile friendly. So let's go ahead and open this exact form, but with CSS. So let's open this up. This is our end form. Now, uh, now you can see that um, this already has our CSS styling. And if we try to uh, minimize this screen, it is now being responsive and it's adjusting itself uh, for it to be mobile friendly. And if we try to inspect it and if you click this button, as you can see here, this is the Galaxy S5 uh, screen size and the form is mobile friendly. You can also uh, check the iPhone 10 or even an iPad. So now that you've seen uh, the end form and the power of CSS. Let's open our starter form and let's try to implement the CSS using the load resource command. So let's open that up. All right. So the first thing that I want to show you is this feature that we are using called screen tip. So I wanna show you first its function in InfoPath. So if we try to uh, right click a text box and go to text box properties, you, and let's go to advanced tab. You see this screen tip uh, field and let's try to input a, a label here. Let's say test. Screen tip and click up and let's click apply. And when we go to preview, and if we hover to that text box, so um, the purpose of the screen tip is to provide a small window for a descriptive text for your text box. Uh, but thanks to Kaurush, he created a JavaScript wherein we can use this screen tip to provide a unique identification, which is called a class for specific sections and fields. So this way the class can be used to apply CSS formatting on that specific control. So uh, meaning if I want to have this specific section, a green background color without changing the style of other sections that is possible through the screen tip JavaScript uh, that Kaoru uh, made for us. So. To do that, let's um, you let's select a section and let's go to section properties like we did, and then go to advanced tab. Now, um, now in the screen tip, to be able to use 
the function of the JavaScript, you need to start the name with my. So that's because the JavaScript is looking for that specific prefix. So let's just name this my sample. And then, so when you try to call this in CSS, you will be able to add CSS declarations or styles to this specific section only without uh, uh, overlapping the design of the other sections that you have. So now that uh, we've, uh, we've shown you the steps on how to add a screen tip, um, I've already added a few screen tips into our starter form. So this is our section, which is our the whole form. And I've already added here a screen tip, which is called my main. And then, and then inside this main, in this section, I've also added here a screen tip called my body. Now, uh, that's how easy it is to use the screen tip function and be able to incorporate it in CSS and I I will show you later on how do we call it in CSS. So let's first uh, proceed with adding our resource pass, so which is our CSS and JavaScript pass. To do that, let's go to data uh, resource files and then let's click add. Now um, the JavaScript for screen tip swap and the style CSS is already included in the package that uh, we provided. So you just need to open the screen tip swap and click OK. Now that's already added in the resource files. Let's try to add our CSS styles. Now, now, that's, now that we've added that resource files, let's now use the load resource command to be able to implement these in our form. So let's go to our Kadabra secondary data source and let's open the manage rules. And let's go to finish loading. So of course we want the CSS to be applied upon loading the form. That's why we are including it in our finish loading node. So let's create an action and let's name it load resource. All right, so this is where we are going to use the Kadabra root command. So let's add and set a fields value. And in the field, um, let's set here the command from the Kadabra uh, secondary data source. So let's select the command. And in the value, we are going to run the load resource command of Kadabra rules. And since we do have two resource files, um, we have to call them both. So to do that, let's add a parameter. So let's add a backslash and type name. So that's the parameter. And then equals to the name of your JavaScript or your, C or your CSS file. So the name of our JavaScript file is screen, screen tip swap.js. And let's click OK. And now let's try to load our CSS file. So let's set a fields value. And then for the field, let's click this button and then make sure you're on Kadabra rules secondary data source and click command. And then for the value, again, let's we will be using the load resource command. And then for the parameter of the name, uh, the name of our CSS is styles, so dot CSS. And let's click OK. Now, once that's done, you've added the resource pass, you've triggered the load resource command. The result of this form is the end form that I showed you earlier. Now, um, I want to quickly show you what's included in the CSS and how it became responsive. So if you want to open uh, the CSS, just you can open it in Notepad uh, and then you will be able to see um, the programs included on that CSS file. So one of the things that you need to do to make it a responsive form is to declare it with and use a percentage type. So in here, as you can see, I, I have declared 
the table, the column, the section, and the XD expression box, which is equivalent to our calculated value field, to a to have a with 100%. So this is me saying that I want this controls to expand its fullest with within the screen. So, and if you try to minimize this, it will adjust itself to the screen because it is a percentage. So that way it can be responsive and you will be able to use this um, in your mobile. So you, can, you will be able to open your form and see and know that it is mobile friendly. And then you can also use this with different controls, not just the tables, the columns. It depends on the design and the layout of, of your form. But for our starter form, we are declaring the width size of these uh, selections. And now for uh, below the uh, this declaration, we have the main and the body. If you recall, I, I showed you earlier how to apply the screen tip and what is per, what what's its purpose. Um, and to be able to, to really show you what it does is, let's go back to our end form. And let me quickly show you the style of our main uh, section and the body. So our main section has a different color, as you can see, this is the main section. Um, it has a light gray color. Now our body section is this card, this one. This has a light, uh, this is a, has a white background color. And as you can see, it looks like a card type. Now I was able to give them two distinctive designs because of the screen tip uh, swap JavaScript that we have right, that we uh, have right now. And let's go back to our CSS style. If you look at our main, um, declaration, as you can see, I've changed its color uh, to a light gray. And then for my, for the body section, I've changed its color to white. And then for the border radius, this is the edge of, of the section uh, wherein it will curve its ends. Um, and I've declared its value to 20. PX. For the box shadow, I've also added a box shadow. If you did notice, there is a box shadow behind that card. And then for the width, as you can see in our end form, um, it did not expand. Uh, it's left, it did not expand throughout the, the field. It still has spaces from with its left and right. That's because our width, our width is just 90%. And then I've also added a margin and bottom um, declarations for it to have spaces at the top. So that is the power of the screen tip. Again, I was able to design two distinctive, two different sections with distinctive designs. Now, I also want to show you uh, this feature on, let me minimize this. If I slowly uh, minimize our screen, as you can see, it changes. Uh, the form changes its style. And when the screen is small, the our field stacks up. So that's because of CSS. And I want to show you how that happened. So let's go to our bot to the bottom of our CSS style. We have this, and I commented out responsiveness. And at this, this first um, program, this is just me saying that, hey, um, my full name, which is I use the screen tip for, let's go back to our form. My full name is this section, as you can see. So um, under, full, under my full name section, we have the first name, and the, la and the last name sections. So let's just focus on my full name. And then I'm just declaring 
uh, uh, with 95% for the XD text box. The XD text box is our text field. So if we go back, this is 95% width of the text box. And uh, the way how I did to change its 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 styling when it reach when it reaches what is it eight hundred uh, uh, width of the the screen. So let's go back. I used here a function called media screen. So the media screen is is one way uh, for us to to. Uh, to change the design when we reach to a specific screen width. So if we try to extend again the screen, it changes. So this, this code, so let's um, focus again on my full name. This is me saying that, hey, I want the display of the full name section to be flexible. So what does that mean? Um, it means that, um, meaning we want it to be flexible and because it is flexible, it now made a container wherein the direct child of the full name section will be in line to that container. So that's a bit confusing uh, to hear. So let me just show you how that happened. Um, let's go and and inspect this. There we go. As you can see in my screen, that is the full name section. And under that full name section, we have two uh, direct child of, of that full name. So this is uh, two sections for the first name and the last name. So the display flex is, is the purpose of the display flex is to make a container and make this child of the of that full name and make them in line in within that column so they are in line in that container that's why it's not stacked up anymore as you can see and for this the other declarations uh justify content this is just saying that hey i want those two child to have the same spaces. I want them to have the same margin, the same paddings evenly. And then for the width, um, yes, you, the width of the text box and the full name and the label should be 100%. Now, what, this, what does this flex one mean? So let's go back to um, our form. And let's just quickly I can't find the flex one but it should be here um all right so let me just explain the flex one oh here we go I've seen it the flex one just means that hey use all of the spaces of my full name container don't waste any space, use every space that is available. So if we try to uncheck this, meaning we don't have a flex one declaration, as you can see, it is not using all of the spaces available in that container. And if we try to check the flex one, it is now extending and using all of the spaces. So I hope you, you, you learn a lot uh, um, with this lab and if you want to achieve a specific design for your forms, you can search numerous CSS declarations online. But if you need any assistance, of course, we'll be glad to help you out. So thank you. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so are all of the fields in the form uh, encapsulated in their own section? Um, like it looked like you like there were each you have like a major section and then you have mm -hmm. everything is sort of like in threes it looks like where um yeah so I I I, I did this and I added a few sections because 
adding a section creates a new divider. And I wanted to have a, a specific de designs for each divider. And I was able, uh, if for example, what I showed earlier is I have a main section and a body section. That's because I want them to have a uh, different design. So that's why I had multiple sections. But it, it's, it depends on you and how you want uh, to structure your form and to lay out them. So you can add a section without creating a, a node. Um, if you click, yes, if you click on the section, you're binding them all to the same field, mm -hmm. right? The same. This is a, a common trick when when you've got um, you want to add a lot of sections to your form. You don't necessarily want them to create new folders in your fields, right? So right. you just bind them all to the, the main root node there. Okay. So does the, the full name section, um, it has two sections underneath that. Is that mm -hmm. one? Yeah, that's correct. So this is the full name. Okay. And yep. And we have two sections underneath. I will actually explain why we have another section for the first name and last name for the next lab for the floating labels. Yeah, this is a little different than what we've done in the past, um, but it, it's very clever, Nisha, that you came up with this way to do it. And, um, you know, once again, it's really targeting the, the mobile to allow for not only laying it out responsibly, but also collapsing it if you have more than one table or more than one column. Um, and I think there's another way to do it. Did, did we, in the original lab that we did back in, uh, was it April or May? I forget. When, when we did that with Cowder's uh, sample, did she do it this way too? Yeah, sure, or was it different? Um, this is Kirby Patrick. I think yeah. it's the same, yeah, it's the same technique. Okay. Great. Any other questions for, for Yesha? I like how you point out the flex stuff. I haven't seen that before, Yesha, that was cool. Yeah. All right, so um, if we don't have any more questions, I can proceed to our next lab, which is our floating labels. So let me go back to our course directory. And there we go. So for uh, lab two, we will be showing you how to add the floating labels feature, which was uh, presented earlier by uh, Joanne. So again, we will be showing you how to add the floating labels feature to your forms with the CSS and JavaScript that Kadabra will share for you. So let me go ahead and, and show you the end form of this lab. Let's try to open a form. So if you try to hover or type a text here, um, as you can see, the, the label has now floated. And it's not just floating. It also changed its, its color, its background, its uh, background color. That's because we still, we still want uh, the focus to be on the input of the user. But of, but of course, you can redesign this to the style that you want. So let's try to achieve this by going to our starter form. Let me close this one and then open our lab two and click design. All right, so let's first add the resource files. So again, let's go to data and then click resource files. Now uh, in our starter form, we already have the screen tip swap uh, JavaScript. Let's go ahead and ha add the other resource files that is also included in your package. So day two. Um, so let's first add uh, the float label JavaScript. And then again, let's add our CSS styling. And click OK. 
So once that's done, as you have probably noticed by now, I have removed the first name and the last name sections because we will be going through the steps on the layout of the control so that you will be able to utilize the CSS and JavaScript that we will be providing you. So let's go ahead. And uh, this is actually the section full name. So we will be adding here the sections for the first name and the last name. So let's go to controls and expand this and go to containers and select section. Now, as Pat Patrick mentioned earlier, uh, we can change the binding of this section and let's select its parent group, its parent um, group field and click okay. And once you've changed the binding of that section, you can now uh, remove the group folder that was instantly created because we won't be using that. Um, after deleting the, the group one folder, let's go to uh, the section properties and go to the advanced tab. Now, this is where we are going to add the screen tip that is being called in the provided CSS and JavaScript uh, files. So the name of this section should be float label um, section. All right. So let's click apply and click OK. Now let's try to add the, the label um, by adding a calculated value. So for the X path, let's insert field or group and choose the parent group again, which is the personal information, click OK. Let's move that at the top. And then let's go to properties of the calculated value. In the general tab, let's display this. Let's add a text and type in first name and click up, sorry, let's go to size first. Since this is a bit small, we want this a 100% width. And then for the advanced tab, uh, we will be adding a screen tip again because this is being called by uh, the provided CSS in JavaScript. So we are going to name the label field label and click apply. All right, so once we've added the label, we are now going to add our text box, which is our first name. Let's drag and drop that into our section and let's remove this label. Now let's go to the text box properties and then we will just be changing its size. So let's change this to 100% and click apply. So let's do that step one more time just for us to be familiar with how the layout of the float la floating labels is. So again, let's add a new section. This time we are going to uh, do this for the last name. So let's add a section. Again, as you can see, it created a new folder called group two. And then let's go to section properties. Sorry, let's first change its binding. And then click the personal information, its parent group field and click OK. Once it's, the binding has been changed, let's delete this group two folder as we won't be needing that anymore. And then Let's add our calculated value, which is our label. For the X path, insert filler group. Let's uh, choose personal information, click OK, and then OK. Once that's done, let's go to calculated value properties. And for the text, we want this to be labeled last name. And then we want to change its size to 100%. Click. And then again, the screen tip of this should be my 
field, sorry, my field label and click apply. I may have forgotten to add the screen tip. Yeah, so uh, two things that we should not forget is to add the screen tip of the section and to add the screen tip of the label. So again, for the screen tip of the section, this should be named my float label section. Click apply and click OK. And then we are going to drag and drop our last name field, our text box field. And then let's just remove this label. And let's change the size of this text box. It's a bit too small, 100%. Click apply, click OK. So now that we've done that, um, uh, now that we've added the section, the label, and the text box, again, just don't forget to add the screen tip of the section and the label, just like I told you earlier. So let's go ahead and add the load resource. Um, let's go to our Cadabra rules secondary data source, finish loading. And as you can see, we already have our load resource action here, but it is currently just uh, loading our screen tip swap JS. Um, and we will be loading another two files. So let's go ahead and call our Kadabra rules command. And the command rules should be load resource. And add a parameter, which is equals to, so the name of our JavaScript is float label dot JS. Click OK. Now we are going to call, um, we are going to load our CSS style. So let's go on and click this and go to Kadabra secondary data source and click command. And the value again, let's type load, load resource and then add a parameter name is equals to styles.css. And let's click okay. So once you have done all of those steps, you will achieve the floating label features to your forms. And uh, I also want to go through quickly how the floating label CSS works. So let's open our CSS. You can open, again, you can open the CSS um, included in the package and you can open it in um, your notepad. So I've added here a comment floating label. So this is the code uh, or the program used for, for achieving the floating labels. So the span.myField label, as you recall, uh, we named our calculated value. We entered in the screen tip the name my field value, uh, my field label, because we wanted it to have a, a, a specific design. So we added here a width 55%. And for the position, we said it should be absolute. So the absolute positioning means that the element is taken completely out of the normal flow of the page layout. So the next declarations that we did is we, we positioned it. So the, um, if you're going to use the this, this code, um, you can reposition your labels to, to, to the position that you want in your forms. And then we have this Z index. So what the Z index means, it's saying that, hey, I want my label to go in front of my uh, my uh, text box. If, if you're using um, a Word document um, and you right click a picture, and you right click a properties of a picture, um, you can actually see there that there is a function bring to front and bring to back. So that's uh, the what the Z index is doing. It's I'm saying that, hey, bring the label to front because I don't want it at the back of our text box, All right? So next uh, declaration, that we did is the trend transition. This is just um, saying that, hey, 
uh, it will take 0 0.4 seconds to, to transition to the top. And then we've added a margin uh, on that uh, label. So next is this. So this code is saying that is calling the float label section. So this is the section that we created earlier um, and saying that if it has value, if you hover on that section, if there is focus within, focus within means that you've clicked, uh, you tried to click that section and then float label section stay. Uh, this is uh, the style that you want uh, when it is on the top. So if it has value, if the field has value, if you hover, if there's focus within, it should stay uh, on that position. So this is the design that, that, that we did as, uh, as you see here in our, in our, in our form, um, the color changed into a light gray. And then the width, we just said auto. And then for the font size, we made it a bit smaller um, because we want the focus to be in the on the output of, of the on the input of the user and then the top this is the position of, of of the floating label and then for the background color we just declared it white so that's this uh the all of the declarations that we used in the floating label css so you can use this uh, uh code if the structure that you did was the structure that I, we did in the step-by-step -step of the first name and last name. You can definitely use this uh, CSS and change it up to whatever styles that you want. And then if you recall, we added a JavaScript float label JavaScript. So this JavaScript is, is its purpose is to, uh, to, the for the label to stay at that position when it floats so that's that's what the javascript is doing and thank you karu for 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 providing this uh floating label and J javascript and css code so that's how you add the floating labels and i hope you will be able to implement this to your forms so thank you Thank you very much, Yesha. That's a wonderful demo. We learned a lot about CSS styling. I think that you did a very good job explaining this technique. Um, so uh, does anyone have any question for Yesha? If not, uh, I suggest that we, we pause uh, for a few minutes. We will take a break. Uh, and then we will back for lab three after 10 minutes, if that's okay. All right, okay, so we'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thanks.
Okay, welcome back again in day two of our Forms Weaver training class. Thanks for staying with us. So we will now continue with lab three. So if you have the course directory ready, you can download the lab three contents from the training form, download the package from here. So I just wanna make sure that everyone can hear me Yes, sure. Yes, good. Yep. Okay, good. All right. So once you downloaded the package, you're going to have something like this. You will have the resource files that are required to make the Flex Task Pane work. So we have three resource files. Uh, we've got the epiflex.css, screentipswap.js, which Yesha also used in uh, both of lab, labs one and two. And we, are, we also have a toggle class.js, uh, which is uh, another JavaScript that we're using here in this lab. So other things you have here, you have the PDF with full instructions on how to apply the flex task pane technique into your form. And then, and last you have the, the end form, the task pane flex dot x is in. So if you upload the, the end form, you can actually just directly upload that to your forms viewer. And here's what you're gonna see. Okay, so this is a toggle toggle button for displaying and hiding the task pane. So by default, the task pane is not showing. So if I click here, the task pane will show and make a, a sliding transition. So it's kind of doing a, a smooth expand and collapse action here. And it's all because of the combination of CSS and JavaScript that uh, we used. So we're using Q rules to, to load those resource files. And then, so you have your content here and you have your fixed header here at the top. And based on the button that I click here, it will display a different section. So the sections are, are uh, sort of like a placeholder for your form fields. So if you're going to start a form from scratch, this is a, um, it's it's really nice to use this form because you already have a placeholder for all of the of the sections, and you have you can use the buttons here to display the sections using a hide show formatting rule like that. So if I'm displaying a section that contains a, a repeating table, in this case, I'm querying a list here. As you can see, um, the content has a separate scroll, you know, and uh, the task pane doesn't scroll away if the table goes really long like this. And if I click another menu here, it will display a different section like that. So this technique is, uh, uh, can, be, can benefit you because you can use the section instead of using a separate view in your form. So we've seen most InfoPath users, when they design form, they would just create a new view for this and a separate view for, for this. So sometimes it takes um, a really long time to, to load the forms in the browser if you have multiple views. So um, it can add an, uh, an impact in the performance for your form. So in this case, we're just using one view. So when it comes to performance, it's really just amazing and cool. So I have a, a help section here. So 
when using this sample form, there's already, uh, already a separate uh, instruction here, which is very straightforward. Um, so because the, the help section is really long because it displays a long text, the task pane will display its own scroll bar like that. And as you can see, the other content section is not scrolling away when I scroll from my task pane here. Okay, so that is the, the end form for this lab. So um, I'm gonna show you now how you can apply this technique. Actually, I, I wanted to show you how to do this from scratch because uh, previously we just uh, tell users to, oh, use this sample form, just um, upload that to forms you already know. But uh, now, uh, for a change, I will start uh, the form from scratch. Okay, so I'll just follow the, the, the steps here. If you have it open, so that's what I'm gonna do. So I just opened, uh, I created the blank form in InfoPath, and I already injected this with curls because you need curls for this. Uh, task pane to work and I'm gonna delete the default table that comes with the with view one so what I'm gonna do is add a new section okay, hold on a second so this will create a new group and it will add that group to your main data source, I, I just simply rebind that to, to the root node like that. So this becomes your header, your header section. And like what Yesha showed you, I'm going to use the screen tip. So for this technique, you need to specify the exact naming convention for the screen tip. So take note of that, follow the the naming that we use, especially the, the prefix here because the CSS will look for that. Okay, so click apply. And then I will add a two column table and insert a logo. Okay. Uh, Where are my logos? Okay. And I will add a picture button. And for this picture button, I will use an image. I will add that as resource file. I call it hamburger. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so this is the, the header section. And then I will add another section here. Okay, rebind that to my fields. Please let me know if I'm going too fast. And this will be the container for our flex items. So it's like a parent, parent uh, container. So I will name it my underscore main. And I just basically co copy the same section. And for, for this, this will serve the content <clears throat> for, uh, this will hold the content for our form. So I will name that my content. <clears throat> okay. And this one will be the task pane. Okay. I do that really fast. So this is the task pane. 
Okay, and can be adjusted to a smaller size and this can take up the width of the main section. Okay, so that's how it looks. And, okay, let's add some padding here. And of course you need some, some fields to put into your content. So I'll just put some user info here. Just basic info. Don't want to keep this long. And for this, I will, I think I will add another section and I will bind that to that user group there. And let's insert a two column table with four, uh, two rows. And just then one by one there. This is just a sample form. And you know, it, it really depends on what your form content is. Okay, let's see this. And then for my task pane, uh, you can insert a table here one column table to hold the buttons. Let's make this larger or no. Okay. And this is where I add the buttons. and make them 100%. So it's taking up the full width of the task pane. And I don't know what, what I'm able to display there, just a sample. Uh, okay, so for your button labels, you can use any label for your buttons, depends on your form requirements. But in this sample, I'll just use menu one. But for the button ID, so this is important, you need to use the exact naming convention for the buttons because the CSS will look for this. So for my button one, I will name it button of BTN underscore menu one. And for the second button, I just copy and paste it this below. Okay. And two, like that. Yeah. Okay. Let's add more. Okay, so in terms of designing the view, this is basically it. It's like a skeleton, but when you see how we apply the CSS later, um, you're gonna see that design is changed by the CSS in JavaScript. So I will add those resource files. Swap, toggle class. Okay. So, and I always keep saving my work because sometimes Infopad does some weird things. So, um, okay. So I just went to Cadaver Rules finished loading node. And here is what we're going to add. What are we going to add? Um, load source. 
And we're going to add load resource command. because I'm, I really want to make sure. So I'll just copy this uh, from the document. Toggle class and then screen tip swap .js. Because this is uh, Q rules is case sensitive, so you re you really need to make sure that the the file name is spelled correctly with the extension load resource. Okay, and then I think one last thing is to add the custom command in the toggle button. So we will add a new rule here to load the script, um, okay, back to my documentation here. So we got three actions to add here. And by the way, this custom toggle class is uh, a new, uh, feature that we added in 5.2. So it's an interface where uh, you can add a custom command in Q rules you know, or in forms viewer. And Kirby, uh, sorry to put you in the spot. Can you uh, uh, can you uh, talk about the custom toggle class for a bit while I verify something here? I know you are very familiar with the custom command. You there, Kirby? Yeah. So for mm -hmm. the custom, let's see, um, for the custom toggle class uh, that uh, Joanne showed you here. Uh, it's actually uh, a custom Kuros command uh, called toggle class. And uh, this Kuros command is not built in forms viewer. Uh, it was registered using the JavaScript that uh, Joanne loaded earlier, the toggle class.js. So if you have knowledge in using JavaScript, you can definitely build your own QRules commands and customize it, uh, customize how you want it to function in Forms Viewer. And um, that toggle class uh, QRules command, uh, it accepts the following parameters, the selector, the class, and include. And mainly what the custom, what this custom command does is it finds all the elements with the class that, uh, what's that added in there, Joanne? Oh, I yeah, forgot. sorry. Other class and CSS. Yeah, it finds the value that is added in the selector parameter and it toggles the open class on them. So if they already have the open class, uh, it removes it, otherwise it adds it. So that's why the toggle uh, function works in, uh, in that task pane. Thank you so much for that explanation about custom commands. I know you webinar this in the past, so I know you're more familiar with this. Uh, okay, so but I'm really glad that it's really easy now to, to apply that to, to forms you were into our forms now, because before this 
custom command is enabled or is added to 5.2, we had to edit the XSL before. So we have, we have to find the exact section, the div location for that section, and add the ID for the JavaScript in order for the JavaScript, JavaScript to work. So that is really tedious because uh, you know you don't normally go into the XSL code, especially if you're not familiar with HTML or XSL. Because if you break that XSL, then um, your form will break. So um, we want to prevent users from editing the XSL. So we added this custom commands in Forms Viewer 5.2. Okay, thank you, Kirby. <laughs> All right, so just trying out my form if it works now. Um, okay, so I have a little bit of uh, adjustment need there for my logo. And let's see. So my task pane is working and it's sliding accordingly. Um, it just needs a little bit of uh, finishing touches, I think. Um, so my button highlight is working as well. And actually this highlight is in the CSS. So the CSS file is doing all these things uh, behind. And so, Actually, uh, Yesha did a very good explanation about Flexbox. So this is working because, because of the Flexbox property, right? Um, let, me, let, let me close my test form here and just go back to the final end form. Um, so actually what it does, it's, um, you basically have a container and set the property to display as flex. So in this example, we're using display flex for the parent. Let me find the parent, the my main, this one. So as you can see, it has the class my main. And because we use a screen tip, it adds the, the class here in that element. So let's look in the CSS. So as you can see, I'm using the display flex property just like what Yesha uh, showed you earlier. And uh, so when you use this property in CSS, all of the child items inside that flex container or, or that flex box will be, uh, what should I say, flexible or, or will be the flex items. Um, and by default, the, the flex direction is always column. So I think, let me try to explain this in layman's term. Um, so imagine that uh, the flex container holds this brothers. <laughs> so the flex items are brothers. And imagine that this is, they are playing or they are in a stage play and some of the brothers are are presenting. So in this case, the my content is displaying and the other brother is just hiding. So that is the, the task pane there. And how I hide it is this uh, using this technique. Let me just find the, the task pane class here. This one. Okay, so I'm using this write property and by default, it will deduct 250 pixels um, from the main view 
from the like a DOM. They say this is a DOM and it will deduct 250 pixels to the right. Uh, did I, I say that correctly? So when it's hiding, this property is working. So it deducts 250 pixels. That's why it's hiding uh, on the side, <laughs> maybe at the back. I'm not sure where. <laughs> yeah, so that's how the flex property works. And I think that with the combination of, let's see, position, because we use the position fixed, it's fixed or it's fixed on the right spot there, on the right side where we want it to be. Okay, <laughs> so I hope that helps. Um, if you want to learn more about CSS, maybe you can review um, what Yesha explained earlier in lab one and two. And also you can always uh, check out the epiflexcss.org, including in the labs. And if you want to learn how to code CSS, and maybe you can find references online that will help you uh, improve your skills on this uh, technique. All right. Okay. So I think that's about it for lab three. Um, I guess, Kirby, it's your turn for lab four. And you're also going to do lab five, right? All right, so I will stop sharing now so you can share your screen. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. All right, uh, just share my screen now. Okay, so for lab four, uh, we'll be showing you how to add a slider in, in a form. So uh, it's a part of your form that you can toggle, same with the flex uh, task pane, to hide or show whenever you want to. So I'm going to show you uh, what the end form looks like for lab four. I'm just going to forms you were here and uh, going to day two and here we have lab four debug slider end and I'm just going to open the form and uh, I believe we've already showed you showed you this uh, yesterday uh, so we have here the debug debug button uh, that toggles the debug section which has the Q rules history so you can use this slider to show basically anything you want. You can use it to show approval history, uh, logs, or uh, curious history, which we're going to demo in this lab. So let's go to our course directory here and download, download the package for that lab. So I, I've already done that. and. I have here the package in my local folder. So in that package, we have the start and end form. We also have this debug uh, PNG file here. And we also have here the debug slider CSS file and also the toggle class that uh, Joanne also used in the, in the task pane. And we also have the PDF file that you can follow to Add uh, to add those steps to your to the uh, sample forms here. So first, let's start with opening our starter form. And the first thing that we need to do is to add all of the resources that are needed to be added. So go to the data tab, uh, go to resource files, and click add go to our local folder and add the debug slider CSS and also the uh, toggle class JS file. And I believe we should also add this debug uh, PNG file 
for our picture button later. So I'm using the uh, same sample form yesterday, the end of day report. And the next thing that we need to do is to um, add a rule in the finished loading node. So go to the Cadabra rule secondary data source and click finish loading. And in here, we're going to just below the load JS rule here, we're going to add uh, a rule, a new rule. Let's call it load debug slider uh, resources. And let's uh, call the command, cadaver rules command, and add the load resource command here. Uh, so we're going to add our CSS, which is a debug slider. And I've copy that. Uh, let's uh, add the command again and paste that in here. Oops, forgot to copy that. <laughs> Sorry. So going back, paste that in here and change this to uh, toggle class. .js. Um, just want to make sure that that's the one. All right, yeah. Toggle class is the um, the rules command syntax is very case sensitive, so you have to make sure that you're adding the exact name in here. Um, all right, so after that, uh, we're going to add a section in our form canvas at the bottom of the form. Um, so let's hit enter, and we're going to use our the root group here, which is the employee report. So there's actually a technique in order to add a section here uh, in if you want to reuse an existing group. So just um, right click and hold that right click. And then you're going to drag and drop it in here. And then it's going to open this section or a window here. So you have to select section and it's going to add that in there. So uh after that we're just going to uh adjust the size of this to have the same size as the other sections so this is actually optional um, but i'm just going to do it anyway <laughs> so it looks nice uh let's change it uh the width to a24 as well all right so after that we'll rename or we'll add the screen tip to this section just like what Yesha and Joanne did. I'm gonna name this uh, this section my footer. Okay, click apply. And inside this section, we're going to add a picture button for our debug uh, icon there. Uh, where's the picture? Okay, there we go. And then I'm just going to center that, delete the extra lines in there, right click, uh, go to properties and select the debug icon that we just added debug png click apply and click ok so after that we're going to add a uh, rule for this um, slider or for the uh, button here so let's call it load slider so in here we're going to um, set the command node to have the value custom toggle class, which Joanne also used in, uh, in her task pane. So slash selector uh, equals dot my underscore debug, and then the parameter class open. So I've already explained that earlier. So it's actually, um, it will find all the class that has the uh, all all the class my underscore debug, and it will uh, include the uh, CSS for for the open class. So click OK, and after that, we're going to add another section at the bottom. So I'm just copying this one and paste it in here. Um, adding that to center, remove that picture button there, and we're just going to rename this section um, 
my debug, my underscore debug, click apply and copy that again and paste it inside that section. So this is the new section now, the inner section. Let's rename the screen clip again to my underscore debug content. So our CSS files will uh, find those uh, section later on. And next is we're going to add the QRules history in this section. So go to Kadabra rule secondary data source. And this is where we can find the history for, uh, for our QRules commands. So drag this and add it in here. Click repeating table and just delete the extra spaces there. So I'm just going to uh, format this. Uh, just a little bit. So just going to add some borders and change the header to green. All right. So once that's done, let's save this form. Uh, let's uh, rename this N2 and let's try if that will work. <laughs> okay. Oops. I'm just going to drag that in here drop update and upload anyway and it should give you the same output okay so let's click on that all right so it works <laughs> so I also wanted to show you how the CSS uh, works uh, for this slider. So I'm going to click inspect and I'm going to, I want to find the uh, debug, my underscore debug uh, section here. So I'm just going to go to the top. And as you can see, we found it. It says here, class equals xd section xd repeating my dip underscore debug and open so so that's our uh, section here that that div is actually pointing to this one so this section where the screen tip is my underscore debug so that's it and it's also the toggle class also worked because it, it added the class open in here. So let's see, let's try to toggle again the uh, the button here. So if we uh, try that, you'll see that the class open is now gone. So if we toggle it again, it's now back again. So that's how the JS file work. So it added that open class in there. So if we go in here in the styles tab here and find that open class, so I'm actually going to open first the debug slider CSS so that you will see that we have the open class in here. So, right, so this is our open, open class. So uh, the dot here indicates that it is a class. So it actually adds this um, CSS in our uh, debug section there, the transform translate Y uh, minus 350 pixels. So if we go in here again in the browser and find that open uh, class, let's find it. All right, so here it is. So if we try to um, uncheck that, it's going to it's going to hide our debug section. So the transform in CSS, it actually allows you to move elements and the translate y method moves that element from its current position according to the parameters given for uh, the y axis. So this CSS declaration means that we want to move our debug section 350 pixels above from its current position. So the our uh, debug section is originally uh, below. <laughs> below of our page. So, so that transform um, uh, transform CSS element uh, does that um, 
does that uh, execution there where it where it moves the um, moves the section at the top so that's why it's doing that um, execution there. So another um, CSS declaration that I want to discuss is um, the transition. So if we uh, search for the my underscore debug um, class here, so as you can see, it's in here. It's also in our debug slider.css. So where is it? Uh, there we go. So this is the, this is the my underscore debug um, class there. So it has the transition here. So if we try to, so the tr I'm gonna describe that first, explain that what the transition is. So it allows you to add an effect where the element starts slow, then also ends slowly. And we're giving the transition a duration of uh, 0 0.5 seconds. So that's why you'll see that it glides like that. Um, and if we try to uncheck that um, uh, CSS there, you'll see that it's not sliding just, uh, just like earlier. So that's what the transition is for. So if we also try to change this to, let's say two seconds, uh, you'll see that it's going to be slower. <laughs> so that's how the transition uh, works. So yeah, this is actually the CSS declaration that makes it a slider. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's about it for, for lab four. So if you have questions, let me know uh, before we go to our next lab, which uh, we're going to discuss the overlay. I right, think I would I call it a, a peekaboo peekaboo yeah. slide. <laughs> yeah, we can. <laughs> yeah, we can call, yeah. call it that. Yeah. <laughs> but for formality's sake, we're calling it the bug slider. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and actually, I think that for for other forms, I I think you've used this for history section instead of the bug slider, right? Yeah, I've I'm actually working on a form with. Preston Wood with Richard and Alicia. So I've used this uh, technique in their form. So, yeah. yeah. So, anyway, um, let's go to our next lab, which is um, overlays. All right. So, in this lab, I'm going to show you how to uh, add modals or, or, and overlays to, to your forms. So going back to the course directory here. Uh, right. So there are so many benefits of using this technique. Um, right, so I'm just going <laughs> to open the end form right now just to show you what it looks like. All right. So I've added here. So this is the same form, the end of the report. And I've added here a picture button uh, for information. And if I click on that, it's going to show you this uh, beautiful overlay. In here. Actually, this is the, uh, what we call the modal, uh, the window. And the overlay is the this gray area in here. So there are so many benefits of using this technique. You may use it to uh, grab the user's attention. Uh, uh, you, you, you can use it when you want to interrupt the user's current task to catch the uh, catch the user's full attention to something more important. Uh, you can also use it to for uh, user input. So use it when you want to get information from the user, say for example, for a sign up or a login form. And you can also use it to show additional information uh, just like what I'm showing in here, just sample text. So let's dive into to the um, to this step step by step process on how to add that to the form. So I've already downloaded the package in my local folder here. Um, so we have the I'm not sure what this is, uh, but this is <laughs> not part of the package. So it uh, we have here the starter form and the end form. We also have the overlay CSS. Let me just open that real quick here. 
So it has the overlay container and the overlay um, class. So that's all uh, there is to our CSS. And I, we also have here the, the PDF. So going back, I'm going to close this now. And we're going to start with our starter form again. OK, let's click Design. And the first thing that we need to do is, again, add, a, add our resource file, which is the overlay CSS. Same thing that we did earlier. Uh, click the overlay CSS, click OK. And we want to load that to, um, again, in finish loading node so that it loads whenever the form uh, opens. So I'm just going to add that. Uh, under this um, rule here called load CSS. Uh, let me just copy this so that um, you can just change the name. Select command again and uh, add load resource. The name is overlay.css. So after that, uh, we're going to move again uh, at the bottom of the form. And we're going to add a new section. Again, same, same, uh, same as what we did earlier. Um, and let's just adjust the width again for for the for the section. And then add that to the center. And go to properties again and add a screen tip called um, my overlay container. So this is going to serve as our overlay. Copy that and paste it inside of that, con of that section there. And then this one, we're going to name this um, just my overlay. Um, and this is going to serve as the modal or the window that floats on top of the page. So in here, we're going to add a close picture button. So uh, click picture button here and add it at the leftmost part. Right click and we're going to search for our close button here. So we have the icon underscore close, click that, apply. And what's the next? thing to do here. <laughs> All right, so um, uh, in the PDF file, I've added this um, text here. I'm just going to copy this just for the sample, uh, sample text. Copy this in Notepad to remove the formatting. All right, let's try removing the bullets. And let's just fix those formatting and copy, and then paste that again inside this section here. So paste, and then I'm just gonna fix the formatting again and add some bullets. All right, add some spaces. And after that, we're going to, once that's done, we're going to add a rule in here in our information icon here. And we're going to set, let's add, uh, let's first add um, the name uh, called show information. And we're going to set our field in here in the main data source called show information with a value true. So after that, we're also going to add uh, a rule in our close button, which will do um, the opposite of that rule. So it's, we're going to hide uh, the information when whenever the user clicks the close button. So set a fields value again, show information, and but this time we're going to set uh, this as blank. All right. So next is we're going to add. A formatting rule for the outer section here, which is actually the overlay container. So let's select formatting and let's say hide. 
don't forget to tick this checkbox in here. So we want to hide that um, section if the show information field is not equal to true. All right. So after that, save all of the changes. Let's rename this again and let's try if that will work. <laughs> all right. Let's drag this and drop it in Forms Viewer. Click Update. And all right. So let's refresh the, the form here. Let's see if our overlay is going to work. I hope it will work. <laughs> All right, so let's click this icon here. All right, so our overlay and the model work. So uh, I also want to show you uh, the CSS behind this by showing the inspect element here in the browser. So if we try to click this um, uh, button here and try to move our cursor in the model, it's going to, okay, let's first uh, click the overlay here. Okay, as you can see, it's calling the class my underscore overlay container. So we have here, let's see. Okay, so we have here uh, the position fixed, uh, which means it always stays in the same place, even if the page is scrolled. So this is actually the, the overlay uh, container there. So display block, um, it stretched the element out as far to the sides as possible. So that's why it's stretching in here. It's actually covering all of the, uh, the whole um, page here. And um, for the Z index, uh, I think uh, Yesha already <laughs> explained this earlier, but um, to reiterate, um, this specifies the stack order of an element. So an, an, an element with a greater stack order is always in front of an element with a lower stack order. So let's say we try to change this to one. And as you can see, you, you can now see this um, section here, our footer. Let's try to move it again to two. And you'll see that's the that the overlay is all again, on top of our footer. So that's because, let's see, let's go back again. Let's add, uh, let's change that to one again. And if we try to look at the CSS of our footer here, okay, so as you can see, this is our footer because it says my underscore footer. You'll see that it has a Z index uh, two. So if we try to uncheck that, it's going to, um, it's going to show that the overlay is already on top of our footer there. So yeah, that's how does Z index work. And for our model here, let's try to click that. Um, all right, so some of the uh, CSS declarations here, for example, the border radius. So if we try to uncheck this, it's going to change the radius of uh, the borders the design of uh, the border of our model. So if you try to add or change that to, let's say 40, then you'll see that it's it's becoming, it's, it became rounder. And we can also use the line height um, declaration here. So it adjusts the uh, spaces between our text and the, also the font size. You can also change that in CSS, the padding, and here, the overflow is actually added also. So we have a value for that as auto. So if we uh, try to, let's say, uh, zoom in, you'll see that uh, the scroll bar is shown here. So the overflow specifies whether to add scroll, scroll bars when the content of an element is uh, too big to fit in this specified area. So that's why the our scroll bar is now showing here. But if we try to zoom out, it's no longer uh, showing there. So, and lastly, uh, the transform here. Um, this is required because um, 
you want to center the element, uh, the element or the modal to line up with the center of its parent. So it's basically saying to move the element uh, leftwards by 50% of the width along with uh, along the x axis and upwards by 50% of uh, the height along the y axis. So if we try to uncheck that, you'll see that uh, it's going to just uh, be in here. But if we try to add that, it's going to center our model there. All right, so that's pretty much it for, for the um, overlays. So I hope you, you learned something. Um, I hope the explanation in the CSS declaration is clear. And if you need help with any of the labs, just let us know. Yeah, uh, back to you, Joanne. All right, thank you, Kirby. Uh, I'll share my screen again. Okay, so before we end day two, we'd like to do a quick summary of uh, what we did today. So for lab one, yes, she showed you how to make responsive forms. So uh, she showed you how to, to make your uh, form fields flexi flexible regardless of the, the screen size. And she also, she also showed you how to make your forms mobile responsive. And with the added technique of the floating labels, in lab two, I think that uh, really uh, added some uh, beautification there. Um, and then I did uh, the flex task pane. We show you how to add a flexible task pane that you can use in your forms to uh, display information uh, like help section or buttons that will switch to different sections. So it allows you to uh, it allows your users to complete their tasks without switching to a different view. So that's really helpful. And then uh, Curvy showed you how to add that debug slider. And also, lastly, the, the overlay, which I can already think of many ways how I can, how I can uh, apply this overlay technique to, to my forms. So that's the summary, um, quick summary for day two. And as we always do, we'd like to ask for your comments for, for what we did today. So I think that we only have Emma and Richard. Thank you for, for staying with us. And so we'd like to hear from you, uh, any comments you have, any takeaways or what you learned from this uh, day uh, that you'd like to share with us, I would really appreciate it. So can we well, start um, with Emma? Oh, okay, oh, Richard first. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say that I, I, um, I think all the labs and everything are going really well. Um, I appreciate all the explanations for everything. Um, so thank you. That's all I have for now. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Yeah, I hope you, you find those techniques useful for your forms. And Emma, I oh, hope you're still there. Yep, I'm still here. Yeah. Uh, in you. particular, I was really, really interested in using the screen tips, renaming them oh. and creating the classes. I, ha I didn't realize that that was what was going on in those forms. I haven't done a lot of styling in my forms. It's been mostly background functionality. So I haven't made them look and feel kind of modern or pretty yet. So when I was watching that, I, I was kind of really surprised. I was like, this is awesome. So I thought that that was really, really great that that's how you can apply all the different styling to them fairly easily. So I thought that was a really cool little <laughs> kind of way yeah, to get that done. Yeah, uh, like you, I was actually- method. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was going uh, Kirby, I was going to ask you, um, when w w I had a training session with you um, uh, for CSS, uh, you know, a, a few weeks ago, 
And one of the things that we were doing is, I'm, I'm trying to remember it, it's, um, but we were having to like take the form and then we were having to, what was that? Um, we were having to like unpackage the form and grab a. Yeah, a, yeah I remember. So you, you mean we we're trying to um, extract the source files of the, yes. of the form, right? So right now we, well, Karu um, figured out this uh, um, you don't new have to technique that here. Yeah, yeah, this is the oh, alternative okay. for that. So we're no longer, we no longer needed to, you know, change the awesome. XSL uh, file oh, and right. add the add the classes there. So this is the workaround for that. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll be sure to give this a go. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so wonderful. That was pretty complicated. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah, no, it was it could, Yeah, it could also ruin your form, right? Because you you don't know if you, you could yeah. add a uh, wrong wrong text in there. Yeah. So, uh -huh. yeah. yeah, I'll be working on this tonight, and uh, we'll, um, I'm excited to see what uh, how it turns out. So, yeah, thank glad you. to hear that. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Yeah. And to add on that uh, screen tip part, just like what Emma felt, I, I also felt surprised uh, learning about the screen tip because um, it's actually often ignored in InfoPath. We don't usually use the screen tip anymore, but Kaoru Okamura discovered that last April. And so we're really happy to, to share that with you. And we're giving credit to her for, for uh, this technique. So yeah, thank um, you so much for, yeah, go I do, ahead. I do have one other question. Um, so with the, uh, with the new CSS styling, um, it, where it takes the, the border of your form and rounds off the corners, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a nice look. And I'm wondering is um, what options there are as far as headers um, cause what I've seen so far is, you know, as far as making headers look good, um, what I've seen in the forums is that, you know, the, the header is still, um, it's still a block a rectangle, um, either that, or you just type in the text, uh, and don't put a, you know, in any indication of a, a shape there, um, I'm wondering if if there's a way to have um, a top like a a row placed at the very top of the of the uh, the border and have it to um, have it to where the the shape is actually you know all the way connected into the border if that makes sense I can show you an example of what I'm talking about um, oh yeah. Sure, uh, if you'd like to share out and show that sure. example. Maybe we can imagine, yeah. Yeah, so I'll stop sharing so you can share out. Okay, share screen, okay. Share. Okay, I've just, I've got this in an email. Um, Okay, so in this example here, there's like there's the CSS styling where you've got your your section border in this case, and then they've got um, this row up here where it looks like it could you could use that as a header, and it's connected, uh, you know, into the border itself. Um, and I'm just, I'm wondering if, if you guys have, ladies have um, come across any way to do something like that for a header um, because yeah. it looks so much more like mm -hmm. complete than putting a, 
a rectangle, you know, row yeah. across the, the top. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, Richard. So yeah, this is actually uh, possible with CSS, um, but I haven't really um, used this, <laughs> this kind of uh, design yet, but I'm gonna try to figure out how we can combine uh, different uh, CSS declarations in order to, you know, um, do the same styling that you want, do this uh, design in here to have the header um, just just like this one that you're you're showing, but yeah, it's I know that um, it's definitely possible uh, with the use of uh, CSS. Okay. And to add to that, I think looking at the image, I think this is a table with a table design using CSS. So I haven't uh, done that, but I think we can um, design. Uh, put in CSS within a table and I th um, so like what Curvy said this is possible um, I don't think uh, it's different um, sections I really think this can be done with a table so that we can make it a simpler uh, layout so okay so if you if you go that route with the tables is it going to become uh, more complicated to design um, since you, because uh, would you still be able to use the, the screen tip method? Um, yeah, um, we haven't tried it yet, but let's see if, if that's possible or if that's easier. Um, we, we, can, we will try uh, both ways. So to check uh, what's easier for us to, to, to okay. apply this specific design. Great. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Richard. All right. Thank you, Kirby and Yesha for those suggestions. Okay, so I'll, uh, I think I'll share my screen again. And All right, so again, thank you for all your comments and for being here. Uh, we really appreciate your presence. Okay, so I hope to see you again tomorrow for day three. And for day three, we are going to discuss, oops, sorry, workflows, approval workflows. So if your forms are using workflows, I think that you're going to be interested in looking into to the patterns for showing you tomorrow we're going to show how to add an approval workflow using power automate so if you're on sharepoint and uh would like to familiar familiarize yourself with power automate that is lab one and then we also have another technique uh so that's lab two where we use dbxl to send email notifications so we're going to show you that and then Lastly, one of the highlights for tomorrow is the approvals XTP that um, Kirby and her team is really working hard in the past few weeks. And this XTP will help you add an approval process to any form in just minutes. And I think that Patrick and Kirby also webinared at this in, I think, uh, last week. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so... Uh I'll <laughs> be looking forward to lab mm -hmm. three. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, thank you, Richard and uh, Emma, uh, for staying. And uh, just let us know if you have any questions. If, if you run into any issues in the labs, uh, feel free to send us an email. You can also send an email to support at cadaver.com. And we will send the recording uh, of day two later today uh, so you can rewatch the, the demos if you need to all right thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you. thank you everyone yep thanks bye it's richard bye. emma bye bye <laughs>